Hello, everybody. Welcome into our program, uh, Contra Costa County Library. My name is David Green. I'm the Librarian Specialist for Adult Services. Welcome. Um, and also welcome to Renee Dreyfus. Uh, she is the Distinguished Curator and Curator in Charge of Ancient Art and Interpretation for the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. During her tenure at the museums, Dr. Dreyfus has organized more than 20 exhibitions, including the 1979 Treasures of Tutankhamun ex exhibition, which first brought Egyptomania to San Francisco, and its 2009 sequel, Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs. Today's talk will be on the exhibit Last, Summer in Pom Last Supper in Pompeii, my apologies, From the Table to the Grave, currently showing at the Legion of Honor. Thank you very much. And Dr. Dreyfus, uh, please take it away. Oh, thank you so much, David. And, and thanks to the friends of the Arenda Library for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and to all of you who support libraries and hold library cards, I think they are very special places and they need our support. Uh, libraries and museums have taken a big hit during our shelter in place and we need to continue to support them. I would also like to thank Michael Beller who invited me to speak and can I say this Michael, truth in advertising, uh, Michael is my son and I'm very proud to say that. And I would also like to thank Louise Chu who has put together the PowerPoint presentation that you are about to enjoy. So we start here with the entryway into the exhibition. And as David said, it's at the, it's at the Legion of Honor Museum in Lincoln Park, and it's there until August 29th. So um, please, uh, one thing I would say is that uh, one has to, uh, purchase tickets in advance because we are maintaining social distancing and a 25% occupancy. So uh, contact the museum to schedule your visit. But when you get there, this is what you see. And it's really at long last, our supper in Pompeii from the table to the grave has been installed. And uh, to us who have worked on it, it's something like a miracle, given that most of the objects come from Pompeii's archeological park and also the National Archeological Museum in Naples. Uh, when we were healthy, um, Naples and that area in Campania uh, was ill and vice versa. So, the exhibition was postponed just over a year as we went through the pandemic. And believe me, it was touch and go for a while. And I kept my fingers crossed and my colleagues both here in the museum and also abroad tried to remain optimistic for the most part. Um, so I can't tell you how happy I am to say that against all odds. Uh, Last Supper in Pompeii is on view in the Legion of Honor until August 29th. This is the first exhibition that tells the story of how before the eruption in AD 79, Pompeians were engaged in typical daily activities, many of which revolved around food and drink. Uh, much as our own day might begin. It, it also shows us how digging around in rubble from the food left on uh, plates as people ran off um, to the scraps found in kitchens and in the kitchen drains and by the way in latrines, which is a surprisingly good source of information about food. Um, archaeologists these days do not throw away anything, including what they find in latrines. So they offer us an understanding of how people lived two millennia ago. And we see this passion for the culinary arts and also fine wine that 
gives us a glimpse of daily life in ancient Pompeii. And walking through the exhibition, you'll see the objects on view are varied. Some of them well-known works of art and others used by the enslaved individuals in the kitchen. And um, they all capture our imagination as it's easy to find commonalities between ancient Pompeii and our own world. And uh, in fact, I like to say I'm bringing the Bay of Naples to the Bay of San Francisco. And here, uh, speaking about the Bay of Naples, uh, you can see Vesuvius and you can see where Pompeii is and um, the ash and the pumice and the toxic gas all came primarily in the direction southwest so that you see a plantis, uh, you can see Herculaneum, you see Pompeii, uh, Stabii. Um, these were the most affected areas, whereas Naples, although affected, uh, did not have as much a uh, disaster as uh, those heading in the southerly direction. So on the morning of October 24th of AD 79, this catastrophic eruption of the long dormant Mount Vesuvius buried Pompeii and the surrounding area under a rain of ash, pumice, and volcanic mud. Well, as you walk into the exhibition off on your right, you'll see this painting of Vesuvius erupting uh, by a British artist, uh, Joseph Wright, uh, Wright of Darby. And it's a beautiful painting that's in the Huntington Museum. And I thought it would be a wonderful way to start the exhibition in the most dramatic way. So, um, what, what you see here and what they experienced was how the, volcan the volcano released massive amounts of energy in a gigantic cloud, spewing stones and then collapsing with pyroclastic surges. And that is lethal superheated avalanches of toxic gas and ash that burned everything in its path and left a deep layer of solidified lava and thick ash. The gases that were trapped in this sticky, thick lava exploded violently. And these explosive eruptions flung clouds of rock fragments and hardened lava, which we call pumice, several miles, if you can think about it, into the air, way, way high up, and of course, then collapsing down, destroying Pompeii and its surroundings. And when it was over, the pitch black skies cleared to reveal utter devastation. And by the evening, Pompeii was gone, agriculture ceased, and a once thriving economy was destroyed. The powerful eruption of Vesuvius seems to have come as a surprise. Although we know that a large earthquake happened in that area 17 years earlier in AD 62. And that today we might think of as a warning that after hundreds of years of dormancy Vesuvius was waking up, but they had no idea. And also there were rumblings, we hear about rumblings leading up to the eruption, but once again, they never made that connection. And before that, Pompeii had been a bustling city situated near the Bay of Naples and nestled in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius. And um, because of the, the um, Vesuvian um, debris that had happened from uh, previous 
previous uh, eruptions, that area was incredibly fertile. So uh, what is perhaps the best known volcanic eruption of all times, the city's beautiful estates, surrounding farmlands, and nearby villages were suddenly buried under this pumice and ash by the dramatic eruption. So some people did get away, but those who remained, both, both humans and the animals, were killed instantly by infernal heat, which could have reached as high as 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, recent studies have shown that those who perished in the eruption were well-nourished and healthy. And uh, the remains of those whose last meal, last supper in Pompeii, right, were eaten on that day provide a wealth of information about their health, diet, and their lifestyles. And that's what you see as you walk through the exhibition. We have um, an, a, a case that shows preserved examples of fresh and dried food stuff, which were reduced to charcoal during this, this great eruption. And excavations of shops have uncovered bulk quantities of goods, such as wheat, spelt, barley, and millet, and vegetables including beans and lentils, uh, fresh and dried fruits including figs, dates, and pomegranates. It sounds a little like a farmer's market today uh, when, when you think about um, the grains that they had and the vegetables and fruit that we know they were eating. And in private homes, food has been found in jars, in cooking pots, and even, as I said, set out on plates on the tables. And the foods that, that were found um, in these domestic settings include onions, olives, lentils, beans, plums, grapes, nuts, and even bread and pieces of goat cheese, which were found on plates in the home. And um, surviving non-carbonized materials to include seashells, that is mussels, oysters, sea urchin, as well as snail shells and the bones of animals and birds. So um, as we go into the exhibition, you'll see the way we start the show and we think about a much happier time uh, before the devastation. We start the exhibition with this glorious marble statue of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine, viticulture, fertility, and overindulging, that is intoxication, as you're going to see. He is shown here as a young and a virile god with wine grapes cascading, cascading down each side of his headdress. He looks very much like a Greek, Greek athlete, a sculpture of a Greek athlete. And that's because the Romans uh, looked to the ancient Greeks as their uh, sources of beautiful art. And here very much so in this statue of Bacchus. Bacchus, um, known to the Greeks as Dionysus, he was considered also the lord of the banquet. And he was one of the important patron gods, uh, along with um, Venus, um, of, of uh, Pompeii. And um, the worship of gods was central to every aspect of food and drink in Roman life. And they believe that only by gaining and gaining the support of the gods could they actually produce the, the crops, sell them, prepare them, 
consume them, all of these. And in some places, uh, the growing of crops actually included the worship of 12 different divinities to make sure that the crops were, that the fields were fertile and that the crops grew. But this is why we start the exhibition with this gorgeous sculpture of Bacchus. Then we move into the first gallery and you'll see this delightful fresco of a garden scene. The Romans love gardens and natural spaces. And in fact, they brought gardens into their homes, into their large villas, the mansions. And they had an actual section of, the, of their home, which was dedicated to a garden. But they also showed depictions of them in their homes. And this is a very fine example of a, a garden fresco that was discovered in 1960s in the House of the Golden Bracelet. Um, this was a palatial residence on the western edge of Pompeii. And it was laid out over three floors to accommodate the sloping landscape and the city walls. On the lowest level were the garden, the actual garden outside of the villa and two rooms that opened up onto the garden and a sea view. One room was a summer dining room and the other, uh, the other room was a smaller one and it was used for dining as well, perhaps by maybe one person, uh, up, up, up most of three one would assume, but also was used as a reception area where guests could be welcomed for those going into the much larger uh, dining hall that was next door, which um, both of these rooms had three walls decorated with this garden scene and one wall that opened up into the actual garden. And uh, the enchanting scene was painted to resemble a pavilion and you can see that it's looking out onto a luxuriant and an elegantly appointed garden. And it's filled with very recognizable plants. Um, the flowers are marigolds, lilies, roses, poppies, and ivy covering the ground. While in the background there are oleander and arbutus uh, and palm trees and plane trees in the background. And the plants are filled with birds, making it even more alive. Uh, I've been told they are wood pigeons, blackbirds, magpies, and jays. And some are on the branches, and you can see some are actually in the sky. And when you look closely at this, you'll see that there are also two herms, these protective busts that are supporting, you see the heads, beautifully painted heads of these herms, and they are um, supporting these painted marble panels, and they depict on the left a menad, a female follower of Bacchus, and the god's wife, Ariadne, on the right. Those and the, and the theater masks that you see above offer an, a nod to the god of fertility, Bacchus. So we know that he is also present in this room. But notice how the Romans had an acute ability to observe and depict nature. And uh, the plants, are beautifully layered to give a sense of depth. Well, the big part of the story is the banquet itself. And as I say, we have Bacchus, who was the lord of the banquet. 
And here you see a fresco with guests at one of these dinner parties. In houses like this, um, for the well-off, obviously, guests would convene for these banquets. And dining was central to the Romans and was a common theme in Roman art. And dining brought the family together with their friends and their guests and affirmed always the dominant role of the head of the household. He was the master of ceremonies, he was the host. And this fresco is quite lively. It shows a dining room where men and women reclined together on couches as enslaved servants attend them. And why I say men and women, because the Greeks in their symposia only included men on these couches reclining during the event. But the Romans who were looking more towards a model of, of uh, the Greeks who had uh, settled in, in Southern Italy and the Etruscans, uh, they were more influenced by the Etruscans who included men and women at their dinner parties. But here, one guest and just like a, a voice bubble over their heads, one guest calls out and said, says, get yourself comfortable, I'm going to sing. And the other replies, yes, you go for it. So clearly they are already in their cups, the party has gotten started, somebody is going to, to, um, to uh, sing a song, and uh, the party is animated. So dining was about being social and the Roman word for a banquet or a dinner party was convivium. And that literally means uh, living or being together. And this dinner party such as this brought people together for fine food and good wine, lots of it amidst luxurious surroundings to enhance the experience and at the same time show off the host's wealth, good taste, and power. And you can see in the luxuries throughout this exhibition, the beautiful frescoes, the mosaics, the sculpture, glass vessels, silver vessels, silver plates that were used for eating and for serving the food. Um, show you an example of one of these couches called clean A um, and uh, the tripod table, in this case with sphinxes on um, the three legs of the table, the top uh, table or a brazier, um, but were used in the, the dining uh, images that we can see in the frescoes. And we actually have a fresco of a woman's dinner party uh, that is right over this clean A. And you'll be able to see that more clearly in the exhibition. Also, we know that um, say the uh, satyrs, uh, followers of Dionysus or Bacchus and on the Left hand side, you see one who is reclining and drinking from a riton or a, a drinking horn. Um, one, you have to aim it and then get your finger away in a hurry so that the wine came directly into your mouth and you had to guzzle it. Uh, this was part of the procedure of, uh, of drinking wine. Of course, there were other methods as well, but. In this case, the satyr is preferring the right on, um, the drinking vessel, the uh, drinking horn. You'll see other drinking vessels in the exhibition and also this beautiful marble statue of a satyr, once again showing the um, fertility that was part of the um, Dionysian uh, rite and ritual um, rather a delightful 
uh, marble statue that's in the exhibition. Well, going into the next room, you'll see something that really tells us a lot about um, the Romans' belief in religion. Uh, religion, in some cases we would call it superstition, but every everything depended on the support and goodwill of the gods. And religion in Pompeii was diverse, it was complex, and was an important aspect of a person's life. And the gods were everywhere. Uh, and um, as I say, so was uh, superstition. It's kind of like today we would Perhaps we would have a god who we would worship, but we might have a rabbit's foot in our pocket for good luck. That's the kind of superstition, the things that brought good luck, happiness, and maybe fertility. Um, but uh, the devotion to the gods was shown by daily sacrifices at domestic shrines such as this. And they're known as a lorarium which is named after, there we have it, the small statuettes of the household deities called lares. And you see these bronze figures on either side of the lorarium in the exhibition. These are the household gods or spirits, um, some of them representing the ancestors. And they were the protectors of the household as well as um, there to help procreate uh, and build on the strength of the, of the, of the head of the household. And uh, the lorries, as you can see, um, if you look at the one in the upper left especially, uh, the lorries are usually shown as a pair of dancing youths in short tunics with that same drinking horn in one hand and a dish or a patera in the other. In this lorarium from a kitchen wall, the man in the center at the top is the head of the ha household. He's the pater familias, as, as we call him, the head of the household. He's making an offering at the altar. And you see he has his toga pulled up over his head and he carries a horn of plenty. He represents prosperity and security and is what is known as the genius, the spirit and life force of the master of the house. On his left and on his right are paintings of these household gods, the lorries that I mentioned, both of whom would have held drinking horns. And they represent a libation, that is a pouring offering of either wine or honey. The snakes below are guardian spirits, uh, quite different from our ideas of, of snakes, but they are also protectors of the household. And as you see, they are approaching a painted sacrifice of eggs and a pine cone. So the official Roman gods, the mainstream gods were Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. But the worship of Bacchus, who comes from the East, he's an Eastern God, and perhaps that's why we see him with a panther, uh, a, an animal that was not native to this area. And also they worship the mystery cult of Isis, which came from Egypt. So those were foreign gods brought to Pompeii through the burgeoning growth of the Roman Empire. But the Pompeians were tolerant and accepting of the worship and rituals of many different gods and their cults. This is a marvelous fresco because we're actually seeing Mount Vesuvius schematically, of course, and the, uh, the area surrounding it. And this area was famous for grape growing and winemaking and Pompeii sat in the heart of this wine country. 
And of course, part of why this exhibition is so so interesting to us is because, oh, it's much like going into Napa or Sonoma. And here you have San Francisco and we are enjoying the fruits of the harvest, the vineyards from those areas. And um, the fresco, this fresco um, is also from one of these domestic shrines and it was found in a kitchen. It's interesting that many shrines were found in kitchens because uh, one would assume it's close to the hearth. And of course that was so important uh, to the Romans and, and their worship. So you have a figure to the left of Mount Vesuvius, and it shows once again Bacchus, the god, the god of wine, the god of vegetation and fertility. And his gift of wine to this region was so important to the economy of this area that you'll see his body has turned into a bunch of grapes. And the god is pouring wine for his panther as uh, he's standing um, and we're looking out onto the Vesuvius and the lower slopes. Um, he's pouring wine, he, presumably he's drained his cup, but his panther is ready for any remaining drops. And when we look at the, uh, the lower slopes of Vesuvius, we see vine trellises that are still to this day um, in vineyards excavated near, near Pompeii, we see the same style of vine trellises as you see in this fresco. It's a squared pergola style, they call it. So um, they still are using this similar approach to growing grapes to those discovered in, in ancient times. So it's very much the same in today's grape growing region as to what we see here in this ancient image of it. They have rows of parallel ridges and they still show the hoer's pickaxe, um, pickaxe that we used 2000 years ago while evenly spaced clusters of holes showed where the vine stems and roots had been planted. And in the center of each vertical hole, they found the position of the wooden stake that held it together. Well, um, this fresco is a sign from the tavern of a man named Euxinus and it shows a golden phoenix. And below it is written, uh, the phoenix is lucky, or the phoenix is happy. Uh, may you be happy or lucky as well. Phoenix can be um, you know, translated either way, but maybe the phoenix is lucky and may you be lucky too. Um, presuming what happens when you go into this uh, this um, establishment, kind of like a public house, uh, what we would call today a public house or a, a bar. So now we've seen how the wealthy and the powerful enjoy their dinners and their dinner parties and, um, and how their enslaved servants prepared and served their meals but what about the ordinary people living in Pompeii? What did they eat? Uh, and where did they eat it? Uh, what of the less wealthy Romans who didn't have the grand villas with the kitchens and servants to prepare their foods? Those who didn't have fixed hearths for cooking? Their, me their meals would have been snacks at home or they could have been take out food from the bars and taverns, uh, the equivalent of fast food restaurants. Or it could be a public house like this where you might take your food actually in the, in the uh, actual establishment. 
And we now know through recent excavations that there were at least 80 food and beverage outlets at Pompeii to meet this high demand. And they served duck, they served pigs, goat, and fish, and so on. But it was mostly in the form of stews and soups. And um, Roman authors described sausages, ham, tripe. You can imagine what these places smelled like. But um, oddly enough, while the wealthy ate at home, they dined in their beautiful homes, it was the less fortunate who ate out. It's kind of the opposite of how we are managing our own lives today. But my favorite sign is a price list that was found on the wall of a house in Pompeii. And um, it is, it says, for one as, A-S, it's a Roman coin of low value. For one as, you could drink wine, very cheap. For two, you could drink the best. And for four, you could drink Falernian wine, which was an import uh, from northern Campania. And in the exhibition, you see this piece of an amphora that says Falernian on it because it was brought into uh, Pompeii for this purpose. And Falernian was the most renowned wine produced in ancient Rome. We hear about it, the ancient poets sing of it. And we know that it was a white wine with a relatively high alcohol content, uh, possibly 30 proof or 15% ABV, they tell me. Uh, and on this um, piece of an amphora, it even has the year of the vintage on it. So there's nothing new in our world whatsoever. And I would say that most of the, the uh, wine grapes that were grown in the Pompeii area were red wine grapes, but this imported wine, uh, heavily alcoholic in nature, was, um, was a white wine. Well, well, in the exhibition, you'll see uh, this beautiful, uh, you'll, see, you'll see this beautiful uh, wall. And on it, um, it tells us a little bit more about the shops that, and the bars that obviously were essential to the Pompeians, but the food and drink that were also distributed in other ways. And they had temporary stalls, for example, that were set up on market days, uh, also for religious festivals, on theater or games days, and there were gladiators, and also on holidays. So when you look at this fresco, which is in the exhibition, at first glance, it appears to show commercial activities in the forum at Pompeii. You, what you have here is a baker who's seemingly selling typically shaped loaves of bread to two men and a boy from a stall made out of wooden planks. And I understand that, that people who are really interested in, in, um, in wooden furniture construction are very interested to see how how this stall has been constructed. But when you look at this image, the man in the stall is well-dressed, revealing he, in fact that he's not selling bread, but giving it away. And he is handing it over to the man who is not paying him anything with it. Perhaps he's celebrating one of these important events, or it has been suggested 
that it was a carefully timed act of generosity, or one might say a bribe, just before the election of town officials. Uh, once again, nothing new under the sun. Installed below the fresco and in the same display case, you'll see this is the typical loaf of bread that he was handing out, but notice it's been carbonized. And this brings the story home to us, doesn't it? I mean, there, we know there were 31 bakeries in Pompeii at the time of the eruption. And this loaf was found in one of the ovens and it's been carbonized. Um, it's darkened. Uh, notice that it's segmented when they cook the bread, they put twine, a cord around it so that you actually then had your pieces ready to serve. Um, these ovens were also used by families that didn't have an oven. They might make their bread and they could then bring it, or they would put their seal, their name on the bread, bring it to a bakery. They would put it in the oven. It would be baked for them. They would come and collect it and then they would know theirs because it has their name on it. But this is the typical form for bread making. Um, the other side of the wall that I just showed you is this mosaic panel depicting sea life. Uh, or as Louise and I have been calling it, the sushi, sushi mosaic. It's an incredible mosaic in that it's made out of the tiniest little mosaic tiles or tessera. And uh, it overflows with sea creatures. Um, you'll see squid, eel, various types of fish, which swirl around an octopus locked in mortal combat with a lobster. Just an amazing lifelike image. It's in the form of what they called an emblema or the centerpiece of a large mosaic floor. And these were constructed with the tiniest of mosaic tiles and they would be placed on the floor and then the rest of the floor would be constructed right then with larger mosaics. But this, this is so detailed and you see the color and you see the form and you see the texture. Um, it's extraordinary. And you see every scale and fin of, of these fish. Um, this is very, very Greek in inspiration and in style. And they, these smaller panels were extremely expensive. And once again, they're proclaiming the family's wealth and good taste. And Louise has a surprise. There we go. On the wall is the, um, the actual, uh, the, the, I guess the key to the fish and the sea life that you see. So when you're there, and I hope you'll come to the exhibition, you can then identify each and every one of these, these fish. Well, that mosaic, this, this beautiful sea life mosaic, is quite different from this one. Although they were both from Pompeian dining rooms, this skeleton is not at all inspired by Greek mosaics, nor is it inspired by Greek imagery. This is a local tradition of black and white mosaics, which was produced in a more direct, in your face, simple form. But what we realized, because this was in the dining room, that amidst the jollity and laughter of the invited guests at a dinner party, the Romans were well aware of a less welcome guest. And here you see the skeleton, death. 
the grinning skeleton in the guise of a servant, and notice that he holds a pitcher of wine in each hand. He is deaf, but he is also a servant offering you drink during a dinner party. Now to our eyes, this might be an odd choice of decoration. But to the Romans, this image was entirely appropriate and would have been a topic of lively discussion at the feast. The two worlds of death and the banquet, the grave and the table were never far apart. In fact, this might have been the perfect decoration for a Roman dining room. Uh, could be there during the, the festivities. Um, it's rather like seeing a skull in a uh, still life painting amongst beautiful flowers to remind us that, that life is brief and that um, death comes as the end. The Romans had wished for a happy afterlife to be a banquet with beautiful furnishings and fine decor and beloved company so that they could drink and they can enjoy themselves throughout eternity. Uh, it's, it's like a memento mori. Uh, remember that um, death does come at the end and it's the reminder that we must die. But in this case, wouldn't it be wonderful if the banquet continued into death? So carpe diem, seize the day, and do not put your hope into the future. Enjoy the, the delights of the banquet while you can and eat the many courses, drink as much of the wine as you can hold, and certainly don't avoid the dessert. Well, there comes a point beyond the, where the skeleton is placed in the exhibition when you walk into the next gallery and there's a fork in the road. And uh, you can head to the right for the kitchen areas which is the safe direction, or go to the left for the naughty scenes. And just keep in mind, Bacchus, the god of the vine, and also the god of drunken excess, is well represented in the exhibition, as are his followers, including the satyrs and the menads with their lustful ritual and revelry and images of them cavorting as well as other naughty subjects form a special part of the exhibition coming primarily from the secret cabinet from the Naples National Museum of Archaeology. So these lively and lascivious scenes that you see there, and I certainly hope you don't avoid it, please go and visit it tell of the good times had by the Roman wealthy and the elite. And here you have your warning. And um, let me just say that the Roman world was more comfortable with some aspects of sexuality, such as nakedness and intimacy, certainly more than our current life, I would say, uh, might be, but um, therefore it's not surprising that Pompeii was rich in erotica, and they had statues and frescoes and mosaics and household items decorated with explicit imagery. So here you have some scenes of that area. Some of these Im images, and you can see on the left-hand side, for example, were not solely sexual. They were also thought to provide prosperity, 
good luck and good health and protection from evil spirits. These are the good luck charms that I mention. And um, many of these amulets were in form as, for example, the phallus that you see, the overside phallus, which also could be a, a symbol of, of fruitfulness. Um, and they were found throughout Pompeii. This imagery was incorporated into everything from furniture to oil lamps to whimsical wind chimes that had bells attached uh, that were placed at the entrances of, of houses and shops and all of this to provide good luck for the visitor and those living and selling in that, in that house or shop. Well, if you decide to play it safe, you head to the right. And if you then, after you've gone to the side uh, where we have the um, naughty art, you circle back to the right-hand side, you'll see some amazing objects that were used in the hot and the sweaty and presumably smelly, smelly kitchens of these large villas. These were the domains of the servants. Um, it's likely that the head of the household and perhaps even his family never even entered into them. These were the kitchens of the large villas, the domain of the servants. And many of the things you'll see there will be familiar. There are colanders, there are samovars, pots and pans, food warmers, there's a grill, You'll see eating and drinking vessels and, and uh, um, other, other pots that were used for food storage and preparation and even cooking. There are also some very elegant inlaid with silver bronze vessels. In, these, in this case, they were used by the enslaved servants to transfer food and drink into the diner's vessels and food containers for the guests. Uh, the citular in the center um, was used for mixing wine, for example, and with its elaborate decoration must have been a very precious um, vessel to its owner. It's absolutely gorgeous. And her name was Cornelia, and she put her name on it, so we know this belonged to her. Actually has her name inscribed on it. And uh, when you look closely at it, you'll see deer and griffin running around the body of the vessel. It's quite beautiful. These are all, this case turned out to be quite beautiful. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see an example of one of those wine skins that was held by the skeleton, the grinning skeleton. It's patterned after a wine skin, but of course, in this case, it isn't made out of the skin at all. Um, but um, anyhow, you'll, you'll recognize a lot of the objects uh, when you walk through it. And um, it's interesting to, to discuss also in, while looking at this case, uh, something about slavery, which was institutionalized in Roman culture and played an important role in society. It kind of was the engine that made things work. The economy depended upon it, and, um, and it was the enslaved who provided manual labor and domestic services. Some who were highly educated worked in professions such as accounting and medicine. Um, but others, they came from all backgrounds and peoples of the Roman Empire, regardless of ethnicity or race. Uh, the most common source being new slaves um, from the wars and the conquests as Rome, Rome advanced and became more and more powerful. 
It's interesting, though, to note that slavery in ancient Rome was quite different because people could attain positions of responsibility and social advancement. And a Roman citizen who appreciated his enslaved person could bestow freedom upon him or her. Anyone who had been given faithful service uh, to the household or the um, keeper of, of the uh, firm or shop could be given their slavery. Also, some slaves um, actually became wealthy in their own right, and these enslaved people could purchase their own freedom. So it was a far more fluid meaning of uh, slavery institution than uh, what we have when we think of our most recent um, use of the term. But nonetheless, um, these people um, worked uh, at the beck and call of the owners and um, also um, could be mistreated. Um, but um, uh, as I say, it, it, um, it offered more hope. And once uh, somebody was freed, their children were also freed. Well, um, moving from that to um, some of the these um, vessels, as I say, you'll see many vessels that were that are very recognizable to us. But there are other food vessels that are not familiar to us, like this unusual pot. And we're looking at its side and then looking down into it. And it was used to keep and fatten the short and the sweet life of a dormouse, which was considered a delicacy in um, ancient Pompeii. And you'll see the interior ridges allow the animal to run around for exercise. And there are two dishes on either, one on either side. Those were filled to fatten the rodent, edible rodent, mind you, uh, with acorns and chestnuts. The jar would be covered and the dark jar would encourage the dormouse to eat and eat and eat as if it was preparing for hibernation. Um, I'd like to say, uh, those of you who have read Alice in Wonderland and you know that there's a dormouse there, and the dormouse falls asleep, it's from the origin of the term dormouse from the French dormir, uh, to sleep. And so the dormouse hibernates People found them in the wild asleep. And when they were put into this vessel, they were encouraged to, to eat and then to sleep. And when they were nice and plump, the dormouse would be roasted and perhaps cooked with a seasoning of honey and poppy seeds or stuffed with the meat of another dormouse, uh, the one Surviving classical cookbook, uh, cookbook dates to the fourth or fifth century AD. And it was attributed to a well-known gourmet called Apicius, who actually lived centuries earlier, but they kept adding to his cookbook as time went on. And this book includes a recipe for stuffed dormouse, um, the plural being dormice. Um, with pork, cut up dormouse meat, and it was crushed with pepper, pepper a commodity coming from India, nuts, fennel, and fermented fish sauce. Fermented fish sauce was the most important of all the condiments uh, that were found in Pompeii, and in fact, ancient Rome. And uh, here 
we see a mosaic that shows a vessel that held what the Romans called garum. And a man by the name of Aulus Umbriclius Scaurus appears to have been the most successful local manufacturer of garum, this fermented fish sauce. And uh, kind of think of it like today's um, Vietnamese sauce or Korean fish sauce is very much the same. It was um, made of, sounds a little disgusting, but it was made of decomposing marine life. Um, and as I say, euphemistically translated into fish sauce. Well, Scourus left his name and his mark on his elegant property, um, which he could afford uh, by selling his, his garum and even uh, sending it outside of Pompeii. And um, his, his containers were labeled with such slogans as fish sauce, grade one, uh, and the flower of Scourus, mackerel garum, from the factory of Scaurus. And mackerel was one of the most um, expensive of these uh, fish sauces. It wasn't made just from the innards of fish, the intestines and the things that we ordinarily don't eat. And here is, is where it was actually discovered there were four mosaics that were placed at the entrance, well, at the atrium of his house to proclaim where his riches come from and also show off his elevated status. So the atrium area was the main showcase for the family's wealth, its pedigree, and also at times its religious observance. And yeah, these, these, uh, these houses usually had an atrium, but Scourus had three Atria. Well, many wine estates were situated around Pompeii, but Villa B in the small town of Oplantis, uh, about a mile and a quarter west of Pompeii, northwest, uh, was truly unique. It it included a, a large villa that contained over 1,200 local wine amphora, um, huge containers, huge quantities of pomegranates, and weights for measuring bulk produce. So it seems to have been a depot for processing and distributing goods from the area's many farms. This villa's central courtyard had a tall two-story colonnade and the complex included fine apartments, shops, and storerooms overlooking the area. In one of these rooms, more than 60 victims of the eruption were discovered. They were divided into two groups. The owners and their family carrying jewelry and coins closer to the doorway and the enslaved people and the poor who had no possessions at all were further back in the room. However, this room became a tomb for this group who in their attempt to flee the devastating fury of Vesuvius had sought refuge inside. And rich and poor, they met their terrible fate together. Archaeologists have made casts of some of these victims by pouring plaster into the voids of the hardened ash left by the bodies. And only one skeleton was covered using a transparent resin rather than plaster and we've brought her here. 
The remains of this woman was first cast in wax, which was next covered in plaster. And once the plaster had set, the wax was melted and replaced with epoxy resin. This transparent cast shows the bones, the skull, and the teeth of the victim. And when you look closely at her face, you can see the results of her horrible death by thermal shock. When the Lady of Oplantis, which is how we know her, that's how she's called, when she was discovered, she had near her a bronze jug, perhaps containing water in those last terrifying minutes. She also carried a purse, a small basket containing coins and also her jewelry. And some of these possessions are installed at the nearby case in the exhibition, which includes the jug and some of her beautiful jewelry, um, much of it influenced by a Greek uh, style of jewelry making like um, a snake ring um, and a carved gemstone, which is really beautiful with a bird and a, on a branch. Her gold arm, armlet was cut from the cast and replaced with a replica so that it could be placed in, uh, in the case. Within her cast, you can see a string of inexpensive blue pottery beads, which was found near her stomach. When she ran to escape the eruption, she took these beads with her, along with her expensive gold jewelry. And why she took this cheap necklace, these blue beads with her, why they were precious to her, um, only she knew, we'll never know. But unlike plaster casts of victims, the Lady of Oplantis who lived and died in the shadow of the vine-covered slopes of Vesuvius is an actual witness of the human tragedy when thousands of people who lived in and around Pompeii met an unexpected and horrible end in AD 79. Young and old, masters and their servants, merchants, landlords, shopkeepers and their customers all died in the cataclysmic eruption. So for the victims of this human tragedy, there were no funerary feasts, no mourning, no prayers, no incense, no offerings of wine, of fruit, animal sacrifice. There were no tombstones to carry their name and image to future generation. And we've placed her at the end so that our visitors can imagine on the behalf of all of these people, the afterlife that they wished for. That is a banquet with beautiful furnishings, fine decor and beloved company, dining and drinking into eternity. Little, Little did we realize that an exhibition about food and wine, uh, which um, was cut short by the disastrous eruption, how our story would find a new resonance as we sheltered in place during today's pandemic. And you see here um, a, a short two sentences that I decided to put at the end of the exhibition. And this is after speaking with our staff, our technicians, our exhibition designers, and they kept bringing to my mind how it was so similar to um, our losses now. Um, and uh, so I show you that here. Um, the exhibition also ends with a two minute video and animation of what the actual eruption and how quickly 
those hot gases and uh, the pumice, um, how, how that enveloped that area, um, you know, very dramatic as well. So take a look at that. But um, Louise and I thought that we really wanted to leave you with a, a happier thought. And that is, once again, to show you Bacchus, another example of an image of Bacchus in the exhibition. And he is once again tilting his little drinking vessel so that he can make a libation um, to the gods, but also perhaps in the original statue, there was a panther, his pet animal, the panther, who was lapping up all of the wine that was the residue of the container. And uh, we say to you uh, in Latin, um, many thanks to you. Um, we are offering you this thanks for uh, joining me today. And, uh, and I hope you do have an opportunity to see this exhibition it uh, really uh, offers the story um, very clearly as you walk from room to room. And I certainly hope that if you do visit it, that you enjoy yourself. So thank you very much. Oh, um, questions and answers. Uh, Questions and answers. Yes. We take a look at questions and answers. How about I start you off with a question while you find the questions and answers? Yes, I appreciate that. All right. So one of the first questions we received was, were the interior gardens only for aesthetic pleasure or did they grow consumables within the villa interiors? Excellent question. Um, within, within the enclosure of the houses and the surrounding of the houses, there were small areas, small gardens where they could, uh, where they did grow um, some um, fruits and vegetables. Uh, so uh, yes, indeed. Uh, but uh, that was for their consumption, of course, for the most part. Um, there, there were the larger um, farms that um, were for actual, the feeding of the, of the populace and also for shipping uh, outside of Pompeii. Um, why didn't they destroy the frescoes? Uh, that's a good question. And why didn't they destroy, just, why didn't they melt the, the bronze? Uh, why didn't they uh, destroy the um, uh, glass, for example? Uh, so many of the things that we still have. Um, it was the toxic heat that really caused uh, you know, it was the poisonous gases. And um, a, a lot of the, what you'll see in the exhibition were hidden from those. They didn't, didn't um, you know, some things might have been destroyed by the collapsing architecture, but uh, they weren't in the direct path. And so we still have them, thankfully. Yeah. Um, a satyr from a Bacchus. Uh, good question. The satyrs, you oftentimes have pointy ears. They sometimes have um, horses' tails um, or asses' tails. Um, and um, they usually are more playful. Um, sometimes you'll see a, a satyr that is uh, more like a human, but usually we can tell by the context uh, that it, it's Bacchus and, and uh, by the posture. Uh, that it's a Bacchus and not one of his followers. Let's see, there's a long one. Um, I think for that one, we could just consolidate that to- uh, Can you please, thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. So from the title Last Supper uh, to the outmoded dating convention of AD 79 through the opening uh, 18th century interpretive landscape and so on, the use of uh, Christian terminology and metaphor seems to be rather heavy handed. What was the curatorial intent of framing Pompeii in such a way? Very good question. Uh, one thing I, I should say that I meant to say early on was that um, there was a forerunner of this exhibition in 
um, the Ashmolean Museum at uh, Oxford uh, University. And um, uh, we have uh, what, uh, what we've done here uh, was to form it so that it was more appropriate to an American audience and specifically a California art museum. Uh, so, I mean, the original, and you'll see the catalog that we use is from this original exhibition uh, at the Ashmolean. And the curator there chose to use the term, the title Last Supper. Uh, I don't believe he had any religious intent when he used it. I think it was more as we have used it, uh, of um, a tongue-in-cheek way of uh, presenting this. Um, it, it, in fact, as you know, it's not the Last Supper. Anyhow, the, the eruption seems to have started in the morning. So if anything, it was the last breakfast. But uh, it was a, a tongue-in-cheek way of presenting the exhibition, which really was meant to draw people into learn more about food and drink. Okay. So the next one oh, what is... what proportion? I okay. see what proportion <laughs> of the residents, thank you, at the time of the eruption were enslaved. Um, uh, what would I say? Uh, um, Less than a third, I, I think. I had an exact number, but we don't know exactly how many um, people were still in Pompeii at the time of the eruption. Um, th th perhaps less than a third. There, there, it really, um, there weren't that many uh, of, uh, people who were enslaved at that time. Although, as I say, they were critical uh, to the running of the of the economy at that time and to the household. Okay, um, okay. How long did it take? Well, as I say, the, the exhibition is patterned after and includes many of the objects that were in the exhibition uh, at the Ashmolean Museum. Then um, we, um, decided that we really needed to uh, to uh, to um, form it for us by getting rid of some of the more archaeological material and adding more great works of art. And then also um, we had more time because it was delayed a year. And so uh, we had that time to work on it. It, it was ultimately, it was about two years time uh, to do this. But I also have to say that um, we were really successful. It's thanks so much to our colleagues uh, in Italy at, at Pompeii, uh, uh, at the um, Naples Museum and also the Getty Museum uh, that offered us these wonderful loans that uh, helped to create a, a really beautiful installation. And yet we didn't skimp at all on showing the pots and pans and the usual things that uh, were found in kitchens. So um, I would say it took, it took two years. The other thing that we had to do was to, after the exhibition was beautifully laid out uh, on the drawing board, redesign it to allow for social distancing. Um, so we did that. And that, that, of course, is what you'll see when you come to the exhibition. Oh, are there memoirs written by survivors? They, they won. Um, um, uh, I, eyewitness account is by Pliny the Younger. And he was off in an area way to the west of, of Vesuvius. But he, many, many years later, later, in a letter, 
he describes how it was like a a, a um, pine tree that exploded at the top. And um, he, he describes it in great detail. And he also talks about how his uncle, Pliny the Elder, was um, actually trying, he was head of the Navy in that area. And he took off um, to um, Herculaneum, he took off to try to rescue with the fleet some of the people who had left their houses, ran to the seacoast, and then tried to um, board ships to leave because once they were out to sea, the air was fresher, and and that way they they could um, they could save themselves. He died uh, while trying to do that, and so we know something about that. And re recent excavations think that they found some of the ships uh, or some of the people who actually had gone, run, who had come to try to save the people who were running to, um, to, to try to board the ships and perhaps even found somebody who was a little obese, which we know Pliny the Elder was. So that, that's the only uh, eyewitness account that I know of. And, and I think that's it. Um, well, thank you all. I, I um, enjoyed speaking to you today and um, please do come see the exhibition. And um, well, you can always let us know if you have any comments or, or um, or thoughts about the exhibition. Um, Louise and I are the ancient art department at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and we, we would welcome your thoughts. We also run what we call the Ancient Art Council. And the Ancient Art Council is going to have three uh, events around this exhibition. And those of you who are interested, you can, um, uh, you can go to the museum's website or the Ancient Art Council uh, website to find uh, out more of, uh, about these programs, which are free to the public. Right. So, thank you very much.